Great. Okay. So, hi and welcome, everyone. I would like to introduce our panellists today, Meg Lupton, Head of Social Impact at Westpac, Anna Draffin, Non-Executive Director, ShareGift Australia, Anthea Cohen, General Manager, GoFundRaise, and Victor Lee, CEO and co-founder of Communitea. So, let's kick this off with a provocative question. Is giving a burden or an opportunity for corporate Australia? Who would like to respond first? I'm happy to. <laughs> um, I think from Westpac's perspective, giving in the workplace is regarded as an opportunity. Uh, sorry to not be as controversial as you'd like, Joe. Um, uh, we've been running um, our employee giving program for over 20 years and um, through that program we match employee giving. Um, and we see it as an opportunity because it gives our employees choice. Uh, to support charities that are important to them personally. Um, and it also enables our employees to achieve their social purpose at work as well. So um, that's one of the main opportunities we see from an employee perspective. When it comes to team giving, um, we see that it, it builds that connectedness and relationship building and networking um, with people across different teams as well. And I think during the pandemic, that's become more and more important um, to have that connectedness. And through the giving program, we see that as a real opportunity. And then probably the, um, uh, the other sort of uh, instance is um, it builds on, it can build on other ways of which our employees give, whether that's through volunteering or becoming a, uh, an ambassador for a charity. Um, and so, yeah, so they're probably the main things where we see that, um, it's more of an opportunity for corporate Australia than, than a burden. Thanks, Meg. Would anyone else like to comment on that on that uh, proposition? Anna, I think I can. Yes. Thanks, Joe. So certainly, um, share gives a slightly different proposition because we're talking about investors in the corporate world. But what we've seen is an enthusiastic uptake from investors, be it through a one-to-one -one service of an investor direct to share gift, or increasingly more investors um, opting into corporate actions that we're doing with ShareGift. So at the minute, you may be aware of we're doing a, a share sale donation plan with AMP, which is picking up about a quarter of a million investors can actively engage in that. And last year with the NAB share purchase plan, we had over 30,000 investors engaging through that. So certainly we've seen increasing appetite um, from investors themselves, but equally uh, giving of shares and share proceeds is a something happened with my audio there um, but certainly a great way for um, publicly listed companies to be engaging with their shareholder base thank you Anna. Value. Victor or Anthea would you like to comment on that yeah sure um hi everyone um uh, from my side, so I'm at GoFundRaise and we work with charities and corporates um, on their fundraising campaigns. And, you know, having worked with a number of different corporates, um, I've certainly, I've never heard anyone refer to giving as a burden. Um, a lot of the um, campaigns that we've worked on recently have been kind of the opposite in terms of how can we make it easier for people and even break kind of established conventions. Like some corporates have certain charity partners, but over the last couple of years with various crises, we had the bushfires and obviously coronavirus, we've seen um, so many corporates just wanting to give to more different organizations and allow their employees more ways to give. So um, no, from my side, everyone seems quite excited about helping and giving. Fantastic. Victor, would you like to comment? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't think I'd play the controversial role, but um, look, we've seen um, the good, bad and the ugly in terms of implementation of giving programs. Um, I actually think it's, it's an investment and um, sometimes people forget that impact takes time and once off transactional contributions might not yield the social return that you're actually looking for or your organization's looking for. So I think, um, you know, it really becomes a burden if, you know, uh, um, a giving program is not implemented properly if a key stakeholder leaves or there's just not uh, there's insufficient infrastructure in place for, for the program to continue. So, you know, as with all initiatives, uh, you need to allocate the right resources and have the right backing from leaders to actually, you know, make a successful attempt as well. Thank you. OK, so I think we're all universally on the same team here that we see it uh, def giving is definitely an opportunity or an investment as long as we execute programs well. So thank you for that. Meg, I'm just going to come to you and would like to ask you to tell us a little bit about what a giving circle is, 
why, why Westpac participated in the Giving Circles at Work pilot, and more recently, why you've started up another Giving Circle at Westpac. Okay, so Giving Circles are a form of collective giving, which generally involves um, donors joining together to pool their joint resources. Most often it's a financial contribution, um, with the donors then collectively desired at deciding when and to whom the funds will go to or be distributed to. Um, they are donor initiated um, rather than charity led and also it often um, usually um, there is an educational component or community building component to a giving circle as well. Why did Westpac become involved in the giving at work, um, giving circles at work pilot? Um, it was a couple of reasons. Um, one, you know, obviously working with Good to Give and also um, um, the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne were two very good reasons um, in, in having it done through a collaborative approach um, and having it properly evaluated was very attractive to us. But we were also looking to see and find new ways to engage our employees. Um, in our matching gifts program. We're also looking to bring people together that were like-minded in their um, passion about causes or specific charities. So we saw this as a great opportunity. We'd also done um, some background research and found that um, giving circles was, or collective giving more importantly, was a growing trend within Australia. And we wanted to see how that might be able to translate to um, being, um, developed and driven through the workplace. So given that the Giving Circus at Work was a first for an Australian company um, to do, we, we jumped at the opportunity to see, um, you know, does it work? How successful will it be? How does it drive um, the broader objectives of our Matching Gifts program? And, um, and yeah, so we set it up with, we had seven giving circles, which had about 67 employees participate um, in those giving circles. And some of them were um, focused on causes and some were focused on specific charities. And what was the feedback from staff participating in the giving circles? Um, overall, the staff participation was really satisfactory. We had 85% of employees who found the experience positive and 83% were um, really positive about recommending it to their um, colleagues. So the main feedback that we found from employees more broadly was around the positive contribution to the community and the enhancing of the relationships with work colleagues. So getting that sense of togetherness being part of something beyond your day-to-day -day job, um, giving back to the community, meeting and getting to know different people from different parts of the business and collaborating with like-minded people um, and, and knowing that their collective um, contribution was going to make a bigger difference than what they were going to do by themselves. What about um, the recipient? Sorry, so you carry that's on. Right. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it also helped employees, um, you've got the existing ways in which our matching gifts, we have payroll giving and as well as we match people that make direct contributions to charities. And I think by doing this, it helped employees also get a better, develop a better understanding of the charities um, that they were working with. Um, and it also led to the employees being more invested in the organisations that they were giving to uh, because they got to hear directly from those organisations and know, um, genuinely know where their money was going to have the biggest impact um, through the giving circle. Fantastic. And what about the recipients of the pilot, the, the, um, the causes or the charities that actually received those donations? What was their feedback? So... Of the seven giving circles, we had nine charities as recipients um, and their engagement um, was seen as beneficial as well. Um, they were supportive of recommending giving circles um, or engaging with giving circles in the workplace to other charities and they were also keen to be supportive of organisations who um, where their employees wanted to develop a giving circle. I think the benefit from a charity recipient perspective is having that direct face-to-face -face contact with their donors, um, strengthening the relationship with employees that generally do give, and also raise awareness of their charity um, in, in, in a work environment. 
and it also has the potential opportunity to extend the relationship within Westpac and with the employees that um, were supporting them through the Giving Circle. I think the biggest learning though coming out of it from a charity um, with the charity led um, Giving Circles was that you can't rely too heavily on the charities to lead the giving circles. It really, to be successful, it has to be led by the donors or the employees that are participating in the giving circle. Fantastic. Thank you for that feedback. Anna, um, you mentioned a little bit earlier about Share Gift Australia, but there'll also be a lot of people in the audience today who won't know what share giving is. Are you able to tell us how that works? Sure. So there's two parts to the business. So Anyone who holds shares in an Australian uh, publicly listed company on the Australian Stock Exchange can donate a parcel of shares um, and they can do so just by going onto the ShareGift website. There's a donation form, download uh, or share parcels valued over $2 are fully tax deductible. ShareGift's the registered charity and we'll take care of the rest. So what we do is then aggregate all those donations from individual shareholders and pull them together in a large fund and then fund those out to charity annually. In addition to that, we also um, partner with many of the leading ASX companies in um, in different activities that they're doing with their investors. So that could be through their dividend investment plan programs or it could be through one-off corporate actions such as the recent um, West Farmers Coal Steam Merger where there was a facility for investors to participate in um, the runoff of their funds going to charity rather than them being paid out. So, again, we aggregate all those funds and pull them and then um, fund out to charity. So there's a different ways that investors can involve, but we're fairly unique in that we are the only shared value offering uh, for charitable giving. Um, and we have a sister organisation in the UK, ShareGift UK, but we are seeing more and more corporates coming to us. It's not a case of us going out to corporates now. It's corporates actually coming to us and saying, we want to build in a philanthropic funding facility and how do we go about doing so? So where do you see the greatest opportunities? What do we all need to be thinking about? You're on mute, Anna. Sorry, Joe. there's problems with my audio. I didn't okay. hear the question. Okay. Do you I'll repeat that, that for you. Um, where do you see the greatest opportunities? Like for all the listeners out there, what do we all need to be thinking about? How can we support um, share giving as a, as a way to give? So the exciting thing about share giving is that there's over 8 million shareholders in Australia. We're one of the uh, heaviest holders of, of the stock market um, compared to other uh, listed exchanges. And people often forget that they have a small parcel of shares sitting around or indeed a large parcel of shares and it's just sitting there dormantly year after year it's a real opportunity to actually engage and think about bringing your share portfolio into giving practice. Um, also, we find that, uh, well, the two major reasons why investors use share gift services is it reduces the administrative burden in that you can get rid of those um, share statements that appear and sit on the end of the kitchen bench every year and you think I must do something about that, you can donate it. And the second primary reason is that it's been used for charitable purpose. So investors really appreciate the simplicity of the service and taking away some of the complexity of their paperwork. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, we're now going to go to you, Anthea. Um, we've worked in partnership with uh, Go Fundraise for a number of years. Can you tell us more about fundraising at work? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we, um, as you say, we um, developed this in partnership with Good to Give a few years ago. Um, before fundraising at work, there were sort of two, two completely separate um, offerings. There's peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, which is when someone wants to participate in like a fun run or do a head shave or do something like that and ask all their friends and family and colleagues to support them with a donation. Um, and then there's also um, workplace giving and matching um, so fundraising at work brings the two together and enables um, people who to make a donation to a fundraising page through their pay. So it's a pre-tax donation. Um, and if they are lucky enough to work for an organization like Westpac, 
um, then that offer donation matching, then those donations will be matched, which also appears on the fundraising page. So the person that's fundraising sees a larger donation, the person donating gets to give a pre-tax donation and, and give a much larger donation. And of course, the charities and events get to raise more money through, um, through that product. Fantastic. So what are some of the key things people should be considering when setting up a fundraising appeal? Sure. I think um, from a um, from a corporate side, um, I think that one of the key things is just is keeping it simple. Um, you know, we we see all the time. Often, often it's quite tempting to go out to staff and say, "We're fundraising next month. Go and fundraise." Um, and that uh, obviously there are exceptions to every rule. Sometimes that does work, um, but mostly when there's a focused offer, like we're all going to. We're all going to take X number of steps every day this month, or we're all going to run a certain distance, or we're all doing the same thing, hopefully at the same time. Um, we normally see a lot more engagement and involvement because the, like, people don't have to think for themselves and work out, um, work out what kind of activity they want to um, look after. Um, and the other thing is the more that people know about the charity that they're supporting the better. So um, for some organisations, they let employees kind of choose who they might be fundraising for. And for others, there'll be a campaign where it's we're all fundraising for this charity. Um, but the, the truth is, like, someone's not going to just support a charity because they've been told to, they need to feel a connection as well. So the more that staff can learn about the cause that they're supporting, the more that they'll get involved. Fantastic. And finally, why would someone choose fundraising at work over any other forms of giving? Um, look, I think that from a um, from a corporate side, there are there are just so many benefits from like from team building and building morale. And in a company, you know, we all um, work with our colleagues on um, various things and like to work towards the same goals. But it's so nice to have like to have a fundraising target together, especially if that's tied to impact. You know, like together we're all going to fund a school or we're going to make this incredible thing happen. Um, and then for for supporters, you know. It's donating less and it equaling more. It's, you know, it's it's pretty exciting. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to um, you, actually, um, Victor, because we haven't talked to you. Tell us a bit about volunteering and why that's a, a really useful way for people to start thinking about giving. Um, look, I, I don't think I need to convince anyone here today that donation and volunteering usually comes hand in hand. Um, however, the motivations and behaviours of donors and volunteers actually are quite different. Um, and I think that's that's why, you know, when we think about giving, whilst, you know, from a business point of view, you need to be holistic and strategic, how you actually cater to the journeys of a donor and a volunteer and how they actually meet and you kind of do a swap in the middle and how they complement each other needs to be really thought out. And if I can bring it back, that's that's one of the key reasons why we, I guess, partner with Good to Give because we can kind of bring two specialist organisations with our own expertise together into uh, one integrated solution. How does it work? Tell us how it works. Yeah, so look for, for us, um, I guess um, every corporate organisation we talk to would expect that there's a one-stop shop sitting there that the product works seamlessly. Um, I wish everything would work like that. But uh, I guess if I go back to my last comment around um, volunteer behavior being quite different to donor behavior, we, we, we basically got our separate um, system and separate implementation and product offering, but we integrate the user journey so that a volunteer or a giver can actually come in and donate and volunteer by looking at different browsing pages or different opportunities. But on the back end, we tend to work with um, different corporate clients in, in different ways. So, um, you know, I can only speak about uh, community here. We tend to look at, you know, how to actually build a, a critical mass at the beginning. How do we actually bring your existing volunteers and people who tend to build communities internally in your organization anyway to form a pilot group and then kind of cultivate that culture piece from there. What's the demand from charities like at the moment? Sorry, demand like from charities at the moment for people to support them from a volunteering perspective. Where are you seeing the greatest need out there? Um, I'm going to cut it into a few parts because I think it's quite a complex question. Um, look, it's it's been a pretty bittersweet, um, uh, I guess, duration for the last 18 months after the pandemic or during the pandemic. Uh, we've seen a drop of about 85% in volunteer participation across the board. And even though I think the sector is kind of on its path of recovery, we are estimating that there will be about 19 to 30% permanent decline in volunteer participation itself. 
um, the pool has just shrunk because people found other things to do or they have other commitments that they have uh, committed to in the last 18 months. Maybe they found a hobby. I don't know. Um, but I think what, what it does present is uh, there's, a, there's going to be a huge shortage on the capacity for not for profit to actually deliver the essential services. So what we are expecting is um, once the lockdown has been removed and the restrictions have been eased, that there will be an increase in the supply of um, event-based volunteering or role-based volunteering opportunities coming in in 2022. Um, that's that's on the kind of supply side from the, um, I guess, not-for-profit. Um, in terms of participation, however, uh, part of that kind of recovery is we've seen um, huge um, increases in the uptake of virtual volunteering, uh, especially in Victoria, where we've seen um, the figures of participation uh, tripled in the last six months in virtual volunteering. And in New South Wales, it's a bit of a mix. So there is an increase in virtual but at the same time, we've seen um, people in the New South Wales state actually looking for very, very local opportunities that they can get in touch of. Uh, maybe that's related to our lockdown practices here where everyone's restricted to their own councils and LGA. Again, it's another hypothesis. But I think the, the most intriguing fact that we found was um, a lot of our not-for-profits, and I'm talking about like 48%, have actually started identifying that there are some very highly skilled, highly educated volunteers who have joined their volunteer pool in the last 12 months. And we think that maybe people have somehow found time whilst they're kind of getting used to this working remotely, working from home behavior that we're kind of, everyone's kind of getting used to. And I think that presents a really um, huge opportunity for, for corporates to try to identify these champions who are, you know, volunteering on their own accord to kind of bring them back and see whether they can be champions for the organizations themselves. So those are probably the two, two key things I share. Um, and I guess on the more progressive end, and you know, we do specialize in the skill-based volunteering side, uh, most of the not-for-profits that we supported back in 2020 were asking for uh, marketing skills, IT skills, uh, product management skills, and business continuity skills. So everyone was thinking, how do I pivot and survive this? Because we couldn't deliver our core service. So they were looking for people who can help them through that journey. But um, since then, we've actually moved on to more about content creation, strategic planning. So uh, the, the organization that have survived the initial outbreak has now gone into how do I actually make that hybrid model stick? So that, that skills demand has actually changed between the last two years. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'm just going to cut off to a... Um, a question from the audience now before I go back to other questions, but for everybody on the panel, how have you seen a donor's interaction with giving change over the last couple of years with the impact of COVID? Like what's what's happened in either the, the businesses you're running or Meg, for you in a corporate organisation, what's, what's been the impact? Um, from a corporate perspective, I think the change has been the in-the-moment need and we're seeing that there's real engagement, particularly with the pandemic. We've seen huge engagement when it comes to what we see in the media and where the growing need is internationally. So whether it was um, contributions to find a vaccine, um, our people jumped at it, uh, we have, you know, when the crisis um, in India um, occurred, when they had lack of resources and um, oxygen and other um, um, sort of supporting things, um, you know, the, the organisations that had campaigns to support those, those growing needs, um, our employees jumped on it and then through to the vaccination incentive, you know, um, getting as many people um, vaccinated in sort of the uh, more vulnerable countries and communities. Um, again, our, it's that in the moment and that kind of happened as well um, with, the, with the bushfires in 2019, 2020. Um, we haven't seen much of a change from the giving behaviours, it still continues, both the payroll giving and um, matching of um, donations made direct to charities. Um, but what we are seeing on the flip side is from a corporate perspective, we're seeing um, we've had a very big increase in charities coming to us proactively asking for support as well because, you know, their traditional fundraising methods haven't been, um, have been restricted or limited. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? would like to respond to that question, Anthea. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think um, from our side, I mean, similarly, um, last year obviously started with the bushfires and we saw everybody very, very eager to give wherever they could in whatever ways that they could. Um, and then I think when COVID first hit Australia, 
I th- you know, like that was a time of a lot of uncertainty. People were stocking up on toilet paper and canned goods and thought they might never earn any money ever again. So like it, giving sort of slowed a little bit um, at that point. Um, but what, what we have seen last year as well was um, a lot of, there might've been l- less people giving to organizations, but people that were giving were giving at a higher amount. Um, and that, that goes both for organizations that work directly um, with um, causes related to coronavirus, but also those that didn't. Um, and I heard heard quite a few amazing and stories from different organizations last year about messages they were getting from donors saying, you know, we're really thinking of you in this crisis because the work that you do is still so needed, but we, I imagine you're not getting as much attention as you usually would. So have a donation twice as big as what I would normally give, which um, I just think like for donors to have that kind of, to understand how it works like that is quite um, incredible. Um, we've also, from a, um, a fundraising perspective, obviously um, last year, all of the events, none of them could go ahead. So um, ev- all the events had to turn to virtual events and to use that much used word pivot, um, everyone had to pivot to a virtual event last year, um, which carried on into this year. But the I guess the exciting thing this year was as much as um, various states in Australia were shocked when they went back into lockdown, everyone had sort of been planning for it in some way. So whereas last year it was like, quick, what do we do? I don't know, make something up, go. Um, this year it was, okay, let's roll out our virtual plan. This is what we're going to do. And um, I don't know, I've been really sort of blown away seeing the results of, of different campaigns. Um, we just had, we've just worked with um, Bridge to Brisbane, the running event in Queensland, which got to go ahead in person on the weekend. Um, and, you know, thinking about in-person events, I certainly, like I wondered, how how people would feel running and getting sweaty and running in a group with people after the last couple of years that we've been through but um and then of course how those people's networks would feel donating to their fundraising pages um but this year it raised a record amount it raised it's almost at 1.2 million dollars now and i just i personally i've been blown away to see how much people want to support others in these very turbulent times that's fantastic and i think victor you you made reference to the COVID challenges in terms of the desire, you know, and necessarily so skilled volunteering, but also people providing skilled um, support in their local areas because that's all we could kind of do. So um, unless there's anything you'd like to add to that question. Well, um, look, you know, there's definitely um, going to be a rebound of people who are yearning for kind of face-to-face interaction and relationship building. So to give you an example, we... Um, introduced virtual mentoring uh, about six months ago and that even though it's still virtual and you know everyone I think is feeling some kind of Zoom fatigue in one way or another that virtual mentoring piece because it's a one-on-one relationship first and you know impact second type of model that actually took off a lot faster than what a traditional skill-based volunteering opportunity would and I think um, uh, quite a few of our corporate partners are looking at well how do we use the end of the year um, you know which traditionally has been a peak for donors and volunteers to get involved as a way to kind of bring back that teamwork spirit, team building spirit and start planning some either hybrid or face-to-face events that raise funds and volunteer at the same time. So I think people are yearning for some interaction, maybe after a quick holiday, but um, there's definitely a lot of conversations around January, February, where people are really excited to see one another and come to the same room again. Fantastic. Anna, you're on mute. Yeah, we're good. Um, and certainly from a, a share market perspective, last year was a, was a year of extremes for us. So following off on the bushfires, we had an, a huge uptake in terms of investor donations to the point that we gave our first million dollar gift to Australian um, Wildlife Conservancy, which was a fantastic milestone for ShareGive. And then um, with COVID hitting and the economic impact, we actually expected the business to turn downward really quickly given the volatility of the share market. Instead, what we saw um, were two unexpected outcomes. A, March, April, May, everyone was stuck at home. So everyone started cleaning up their share portfolio and donating bits and bobs from their share portfolio. And then secondly, the corporate market, to pick up on Meg's point, all pivoted into what the, what can they do and where can they start developing more philanthropic giving inside the corporate DNA. And so we had um, increasing numbers of inquiries coming out of the corporate market. Thanks, Anna. 
Okay, Meg, I'm just going to go back to you for a tick. What are some of the things that Westpac considers holistically uh, when looking at the ways employees can give? What's important to the organisation and also what's important to employees? Um, so our broader impact continuums um, sort of ranges from the monetary contributions and community volunteering all the way through to creating sustainable investments. So um, thinking about that shared value impact. Um, when we focus on philanthropic impact, it's obviously largely on our giving um, ways of giving as well, whether it's financial or in time. Um, and we integrate that with very much with the employee interest. So our focus is very much on what is important to our employees to drive that participation and, um, uh, and engagement. Um, and then to complement that though, we do offer and um, provide our employees the choice through our other um, corporate activities, whether it's through our corporate foundations like the St George Foundation or the Westpac Foundation or the Bank SA Foundation um, and, and, and our community partnerships or we also have a number of employee action groups. So we try and make it a, when we talk about it holistically, we talk about all the options for our employees to give, whether it's through um, financial contributions or through their time, through the different um the options, whether it's personally led or whether they want to support something that's um, supported by the company. The other thing that we're looking at is how we can build it into our leadership programs as well. Um, we're seeing social leadership becoming more and more important. And from a corporate, um, what uh, in relation to what's important to the organisation is um, being able to link it back to our core purpose and our own values as an organisation to build the culture that we want within Westpac. Um, our purpose is around helping Australians and New Zealanders succeed. So it's very um, well aligned to that sort of ambition or vision, as well as some of our corporate values and behaviours that we're trying to build within our culture um, are around um, being helpful. So some of the behaviours that we talk about is if I act, if I say it, I do it, or I support the community in the moments that matter. Um, another value is around and behaviour is around being ethical. So um, to ensure that we act ethically, um, make sure that we do it right and where we speak up when um, we see things go wrong. So we can try and link it in um, very much um, with our core purpose as well as the culture that we're trying to create. What's important to employees, I would think it's around, um, and I think Anthea said it before, around making it easy for our employees to participate and giving them choice. So um, one of the things that is really strong within Westpac is that there is that there is a giving culture um, and um, they really want to support the charities that are important to them. And so being able to facilitate that is um, a way in which we sort of support employees and, and what's important to them. I think also being able to see the impact they make, so make um, through their contributions. So talking to the charities around and particularly through the giving circles, that was a really powerful way to enhance the giving experience um, and then probably linking giving to our other programs so um, whether that is the skilled volunteering um, we have another program called the Board of Serviceship Program um, where we um, through the Westpac Foundation or even um, thinking about um, linking it to uh, one of our community partnerships like Jarman, where we um, our employees go on secondment in um, Indigenous organisations. So um, it's trying to make the connections with all the other programs that are available to our employees, but equally trying to um, make it easy so that we can increase the giving through the workplace. Fantastic. Thank you. And this is a, a more general question, I guess, for anyone to answer, but what are the barriers or challenges that companies need to consider to make giving an intrinsic part of their business? Any ideas? Anna? So I think I think there's no single solution, you know, and, and just looking at the representation of speakers here on the call, we're all representing different types and asset classes of giving, and I think that's what corporates need to start considering is, inside their cultural DEA, 
DNA is how they set up that purpose across their supply chain, across their employee base, across their shareholder base, etc. is actually how you bring in different types of giving and different classes of giving and encouraging that. If you just focus on one aspect, you're going to become very siloed quite quickly and you'll also find that you'll you'll get limited engagement. Invariably, you'll hit a ceiling as far as that giving uh, type of giving can expand inside your company. Whereas if you take a holistic approach and think across, it's a bit like marketing 20 years ago, giving is the new marketing in that everyone wants it in their corporate DNA. What we've seen over the last 10 years is this tremendous leadership by corporate Australia in leaning in to encouraging giving and facilitating and having that as part of, of the workplace. But it's now how to expand that across um, across the level of operations, not just thinking about it in one area of the business. Yeah, fantastic. That's that's a great answer. Any would anyone else like to contribute to that? I'd probably oh sorry, I'd probably say um, the because we've been running um, a variety of sort of types of giving across Westpac for over 20 years and I think um, and and the fact that we match um, it's more about ensuring that employees are aware um, and the barrier is probably cutting through the other um, communications and noise within the organization so because there's obviously lots going on so just to make sure that we have enough um, opportunity to get the cut through with employees um, and our leaders to talk about it so that it's top of mind um, when there's lots of things going on across the organisation. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. Um, and this is also a question that kind of anyone can answer, including you, Meg, because it's about uh, your employees using the um, giving solutions that they're offered. But are there any inspiring stories from any of you that you would like to share based on people accessing your particular service? Is there anything that springs to mind that you think would be a lovely, inspiring anecdote? Anthea, I think you might have one, no? Oh, I just, I was feeling like I've, um, I'm inspired by lots of things that a few of them I've mentioned already. You know, I just am, am still just amazed at how people have continued to give over the last two years of um, of things. Um, look, we've worked on, um, in terms of, uh, Meg was talking about impact, um, and over the last couple of years, we've worked on these interactive campaigns where donors donate and they're represented by physical items. Um, and sometimes that's a little bit, um, you know, like presents under a Christmas tree. But we worked on one um, campaign where they were raising money to build a palliative care hospital. Um, and you, as the donations came in, you saw bricks on the hospital come in. So you kind of saw the hospital fill up. And I, I just, I think that was quite beautiful. And it's, it's lovely to see, to be able to see exactly where your donation is going. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Anyone else got an example? Uh, Victor. Uh, yeah, um, look, uh, um, I'll, I'll censor the science to the name. Uh, we had someone who was um, who shared a story of us kind of six months after they participated as, as a volunteer. And at that time, he was kind of our volunteer champion because he'd done single-handedly over 200 hours just in half a year. And what they told us was um, a quick thank you note for, I guess, facilitating the opportunity and allowing him to actually meet three not-for-profit organizations from across Australia that he would have never even heard of. And he shared with us that he was actually at a pretty low point in his career, thinking about, am I in the right job? Am I, you know, is my skills being worthy? How do I, you know, I'm not getting the recognition that they're looking for. But he was able to kind of apply those skills and actually help three not-for-profit organizations bolster up the IT security, build a website, and kind of revamp the SEO um, category. And then actually behave, became um, a better employee in, in this, uh, um, uh, with his employer. So that... We didn't expect it at a time. It certainly wasn't planned to be the, the outcome that we're looking for. But I think that's a, a very interesting way of kind of lifting employee engagement and kind of validating that everyone can actually contribute with whatever skills that they have. And he's certainly been very happy and continue to actually volunteer for, with us for the last 12 months. Is there a sense from um, 
people who get involved in in giving, is there a sense that um, that they respect or have greater, I guess, engagement with their employ employer? If giving services are provided as opportunities for them to participate in, do we do we hear that kind of feedback? Um, I I certainly think so, um, and that's when I was talking about integrating um, giving with other programs, and and um, I was talking about um, social leadership and building that into our leadership programs. We're seeing. Um, that one of the, I, I wouldn't want to pick one particular employee story, but there are multiple examples within Westpac where they may start with giving um, and then they build a relationship with the charity or it might be that through a community partner they've become involved and then they started to give to the um, the, the charity and then they they get more involved from a pro bono skills exchange and then they then they end up being on the board. And what they often tell me um, is they get more out of that involvement um, than they think they give to the charities and, um, and the needs that they have. So I find, I think that from my perspective, whilst we don't necessarily measure it um, in surveys or anything like that, but certainly through verbatims, um, what we're seeing is that when when we see that evolution of the giving to something more um, embedded in their own personal time and practices, um, in addition to the work what we they do through the um, through the company support, um, is that they get as much back and they feel prouder and um, more likely to um, advocate as Westpac as an employer because of those experiences. Do you get a sense that people will choose an employer or um, remain more loyal to an employer if an employer is engaging in some form of giving program for their employees? Do you have any data on that? Um, we well we we do have we have um, we do do we do survey our employees and we see more and more that it, it, it enhances their satisfaction as being working at Westpac. Um, I certainly think in speaking to our recruitment teams that um, more of the younger um, cohort that are coming in. Um, to the bank are asking more broader sustainability questions, which does go to leaning into what's the community involvement, what's the community impact, how can I, what, how can you support me, and my interest in the community. So, I certainly think as part of the employee value proposition to attract and retain, it there is an element that um, it certainly whether it's um, whether it's through verbatims or through our ad hoc surveys, we are seeing that kind of trend happen. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Joey, if I can add to that. Um, yes. We're currently working with uh, several kind of fast-growing tech startups who, who are seeing this trend and, you know, there is a bit of a war on talent at the moment, especially on mm -hmm. software development. Um, and they're trying to nip it in the bud and go, well, look, we, we haven't done a single day of volunteering officially, but let's, let's get it started because we've been actually asked by prospective interviewees to go, do you have volunteer leave? Who do you support? Is there some kind of alignment between you, you guys and the UN SDGs? And kind of half the time you're like, well, what are the SDGs? So at least they're aware that because of that demand from these talented people that they want to recruit, that there is a need for us to actually put in some kind of framework to actually meet that need. So I, I think there's definitely um, growing signs, uh, especially with um, the millennials or the uh, younger generation, that this could be a differentiator between employer of choice and, and not. Fantastic. Thank you. So to everyone now, what are some of the trends? And I know, Victor, you've shared some with us, but what are some of the trends you're seeing across your own areas at the moment? Like what's, you know, Meg, you've given us some insight into, um, you know, what employees are looking for and what's important to them. And Victor, you've talked about, um, you know, the importance of connection and wanting face-to-face -face with volunteering. Are there any other insights or trends you can see that are happening that, that people listening in today should take note of or be aware of in some way? 
I could go. Um, the uh, key thing for us right now is with restrictions easing in many places, e that events, physical events are coming back. And, um, you know, I think I mentioned before, I wasn't completely sure when we were having the first conversations with events about in-person events again and being close together with people. I, I wasn't sure how people would feel about that. Um, but the um, events that are going ahead in person, registrations are going very, very well at the moment um, and so is fundraising. So I think um, those kind of community events in person, people are ready, uh, ready to come together and do things to support organisations together again and to be able to see and feel and touch their impact. Fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else? Anna? So what we're seeing is an uptake in companies' future-proofing um, so they may not be in a position, for instance, to be paying dividends at the minute, but they're looking to build in the philanthropic facilities inside their governance documents so it can be switched on in the future. Um, equally for newly listed companies, um, so with Coles, um, last year they've put that future proofing in, Judo Bank just last week, which just launched on stock market, similar effect. So we're seeing that trend to pick up on Meg's earlier point about building the culture, organisational culture and the DNA is just, even if they're not using the philanthropic facilities now, just making sure that they're in place as the business grows. Fantastic. Thank you, Anna. Any other comments on that, Victor? Um, probably just two more things I'll just share. Um, so yeah. I think uh, most organisations, whether you're you know, for-profit or, or, or um, not-for-profit, they're, they're recognising the importance of having the infrastructure to support a, a hybrid giving model. Um, you know, it's going to be a mixture of online and face-to-face -face giving for, you know, as long as I, I can tell. And, and at the same time, I think they're also recognising that content is going to be crucial to engage, you know, your givers, especially in a virtual sense, because we're just bombarded with so much content lately. So both sides are actually now working a lot more on the messaging. And I think like Max said, is how to actually find the right message in between hundreds of emails and intra internet messages. That, that's going to be key. Um, the other thing I want to share is there are some quite time sensitive and I guess trending social issues out there right now. And I think um, the, our ability to actually harness that would really actually help us, you know, you know, engage and mobilize volunteers. So, for example, climate action, mental health, modern slavery, those are not new, but I think they're now gathering that momentum. And if we can actually cut through all the noise and use that as the way to kind of centralize everyone's focus on giving, then that would be a huge asset for us in, in the giving space. Fantastic. Thank you. Is there a view that there are unt untapped opportunities out there for giving? Like, are we doing enough? Is there something else we could be doing? Any view on that? Um, I, certainly, I certainly think um, after doing the um, Giving Circles at Work pilot, there's an un untapped opportunity which we haven't sort of explored yet around how you could run giving circles across um, organisations or partner, comp uh, partner companies. So how you can build on what you do within your organisation or your, your corporate um, and then build on that with other like-minded corporates I think would be a really interesting opportunity to explore. And I certainly think there's... Um, with the technology advancements um, that there will be some new opportunities that emerge and continue to emerge um, um, to support organisations like workplace giving as well as um, ways of giving. Thank you. Anyone else got a view on untapped opportunities? Anna. Uh, so needless to say, we're only scratching the surface in the yeah. share market. But just for those of you not aware of the value, we're talking about a $1.6 trillion market. So you take half a percent of that value per annum in terms of new revenue flowing through to Australian charities, and we're talking about a game changer. So yeah. if we had That's universal uptake across the ASX 200, across the variety of different services that we have in amongst the um, share giving or share proceeds, that is an absolute game changer for social impact in Australia. Yeah, that's um, very, very significant when you put it in those sort of dollar terms, isn't it? Thank you for that. Um, Meg, I'm just going to go back to a question um, 
you and it's come from the floor or from the audience um and someone's commented you mentioned impact earlier part of the donor conversation is about communicating impact have you seen some great examples of how donors are shown the impact of their financial or time commitment um Absolutely. And I was actually going to say um, when you were asking the question about the trends you're seeing, I think one of the things that I'm seeing is charities are getting better at measuring and evaluating the impact of the donor contribution. So it helps um, to tell the story. It helps to um, uh, reinforce the giving sort of um so, you know, increase the giving that um, we want to see from employees. So I think, um, I certainly think from an impact perspective, there is there is more, we see it as an opportunity to help tell the story as well as increase participation. And, um, and then the impact of giving and how that may translate into the giving of time. So we're seeing... Um, and I wish I had a, I was, I was going to dig up our, our most recent volunteering survey um, and some of the results from that. But um, what we are seeing is we are um, getting better at being able to measure not only the contribution financially, but what impact um, both the giving of um, financial contribution and time can have on a community organisation. Um, and then how that then comes back to... Um, what that means for an organisation is obviously going back to that retention and um, and satisfaction employee engagement um, perspective. But I certainly think the fact that charities are getting better at explaining the impact or measuring the impact is it, it helps corporates that run giving programs immensely to sort of support them back. So what do you think or what's your view on what gets in the way of people participating in some form of giving. I mean, I know I've worked in organisations where it's never been mentioned, and so it's not that I didn't want to, it was just that it, as an option it wasn't presented to me or it wasn't talked about in our organisation. But when it is talked about uh, inside an organisation, what do you think gets in the way of people just not participating? That's a really good question. Um, I think probably just maybe not knowing how the money is being used or spent. Um, you know, you often think about um, there's a lot of attention, particularly when there's a major event and there might be some big appeals by some of the larger charity organisations around how the money is being spent or how the money, the timing of the release of the money that's been um, raised. Um, and so I think, um, unfortunately, there may be some concerns from that perspective. But equally, on the flip side of that, I think because charities are beginning, having more rigour around the governance of um, the, the money that is donated to them, um, there's, the, there's the, the pros and the cons. And I think the, the way in which charities are reporting um, um, tr and the transparency of their reporting um, will help to remove the reluctance of people to give. Um, and I, the other, I think it's not so much not people wanting to give, it's probably more um, the other thing that I'm very mindful of is giving fatigue. So um, mm. we try and balance um, out our campaigns and when we ask people to give or when we promote the Matching Gifts program, um, off the back of the bushfires and then other sort of weather-related events and then come COVID, um, we were, that was something that me and my team were very mindful of. But um, what we've seen that it hasn't, it, it, obviously giving has reduced slightly, but it hasn't to the extent that I thought it would um, because we, we have been a very, very active in um, the Matching Gifts program um, for William Westpac. Because I think if you look at, you know, say specifically workplace giving programs, you know, the average participation rate across, say, corporate Australia, and I would imagine it's reasonably um, similar globally, is, is around 5%. And when you consider that a lot of employees are paid, you know, pretty good salaries within a corporate organisation, um, I always do question why, apart from, you know, the obvious ones like lack of communication or lack of impact stories or lack of knowing where money goes, um, 
if if something's made easy for people, and certainly, you know, there's a lot of organisations and, and Westpac's one of them that are incredibly generous with matching, why more people don't participate? Because, you know, it's often pretty simple and it's a, often, you know, people don't have to contribute huge amounts to make to participate in a, in a giving programme. So it's always been a question that, you know, um, I, I've sort of, I want to find the answer to because I think it's a really important one in terms of understanding what psychologically, I guess, motivates people to give or not to give. And for me, it was always just about not knowing about what programs my organization offered to do it. Um, so, you know, when something's presented to me in an, in an easy way, I'm very happy to, to make that contribution. So, um, yeah. And I think that's what we find. It's, it's more about just not knowing and then how easy is it in order to give when you tell me. So I think if you make it easy, you give choice um, and you share the impact of what the contribution might be, what like, you know, whether it's a dollar handle or something like that, it does help to increase the rates of um, participation in matching gifts like, like workplace giving programs. Yeah, fantastic. I also um, think yeah. that, um, sorry, um, uh, Joe, I mean, we've all touched on communication is is obviously a, a struggle um, with these programs to make sure that everyone knows what they have access to. But I also, I, I feel like in Australia, we also have, it's quite a kind of private giving culture here, you know, um, people don't, so, so we're extra dependent on the comms through an organisation because people are sort of less likely to turn to a colleague and say, I just donated to this charity that I really care about. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what we can all do about it collectively, but I heard someone say um, a while ago that they, when they hear people in Australia talk about their sports teams, you know, they'll say, we had a win on the weekend. And they said, you know, how great would it be if people talked about their charities in the same way? Like, we just came up with the vaccine or we just made this medical advance or we just built this shelter. Um, but, you know, we, we do have this very, about all things money, we have a very sort of private culture um, but I, I would love to see some of that shift a little bit so that people talked more openly about who they chose to support and why yeah yeah that's really good that's point. um sometimes it's seen as boasting actually you know telling people that you actually volunteer or support a certain organization in some strange way and it's only local here that it happens but i think that's that, that's actually about um helping people find their people so if i go back to the uh the giving circles and some of the community building exercise that we do it's, it's actually about helping people find their purpose and find a group of people that they feel safe about sharing that they are really passionate about koalas. I mean, what's wrong with saving koalas? I mean, but if you say that in a pub, you might actually get laughed at some weird look. So it, it's kind of helping them find their purpose is what we tend to say we do. Um, and most people who volunteer, if they haven't actually gone down to that level of thinking of, well, why am I doing this and what kind of impact I want to see, usually might come once or twice because the managers or the team ask them to, but you're not going to see that recurring giving which is i guess why the five of us are here today anyway so um that's just my my, my point of view fantastic thank you but and I, go think, I think the other thing too is that that reticence about australians talking about money and having lived in the states for for years you know america's very upfront about money you're giving tips to everyone you meet throughout a day so it's much more in your face but i think actually just breaking down the stigma that giving doesn't mean you're giving thousands of dollars a year you can start out small and scale it as your means allow um, and as we've all touched on you know, you get far more back from involvement long term than you do in terms of monetary value but I think it is just giving people permission um, to not be afraid and step in even at a small scale and to loop it back into that bigger impact of how you're contributing. Fantastic. Now, there's close to 400 people um, registered for this global symposium. So if you were, any of you were giving advice to people listening in on the session, what would you say in terms of either where to start with giving or how to diversify your giving program? And Anna, you touched on that earlier, where you talked about, you know, not having a giving silo and to think more broadly about what a business can do. Um, is anyone else sort of willing to sort of talk about, you know, what where to start or how to diversify. If you've got an existing program, how do you think about diversification? And if you haven't started, what should you start thinking about? Um, I think you're ready to go. 
Okay, I'm happy to start. Um, look, I we um, quite often we, we conduct something called uh, a community engagement assessment. It's almost like a, a health check uh, for potential corporate clients. And what we found is that, you know, size actually doesn't really matter um, in terms of, you know, how effective your corporate giving program might be. Um, the two key factors I would normally ask or have a, you know, a really deep conversation with the CSL managers actually around alignment and readiness. And alignment is one of those kind of simple to say, hard to do that kind of thing. It's It needs to be authentic. It needs to be with the right community partners. Ideally, it comes to the top. But it's really about going back to the graduate program I talked about earlier. If, if we were talking about, you know, that startup's story, does giving actually become part of that story? It's people actually buying into your organization because of the fact that you also give to the society. So that's the alignment piece. Um, readiness is actually about kind of maturity and timing. Um, and we've seen kind of large organizations who haven't really got any kind of participation, even though the, the volunteer leave has been around for five years. And then some people with only 50 people that are doing 40, 50 percent participation. And really, a lot of it is about, well, is your organization actually ready to give? Um, is that actually on a path of recovery? Are there kind of deadlines all the time and people are overworked and therefore maybe you have to plan for next year and it's not right now? Um, and whether or not you've actually made the conscious decision to say, look, this is a high enough priority for us as an organization that we will say from now on, you know, corporate X, Y, Z is going to project as a very uh, socially responsible entity. And we are publicly recognizing that we do X amount of giving and set some kind of targets that garners everyone's attention into one place. So that, again, back to the alignment, readiness is definitely the, right, uh, the most important factor. And if I may put a, a timing in there, um, we've been kind of in this roller coaster for the last 18, 24 months around lockdown, not lockdown, you know, give or not give. I think a lot of corporates are ready to go back to actually meet the pre-COVID targets again. So if you're thinking about 2022 as the year to bounce back, now's the time to start planning what that might look like. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Victor. Uh, Anna, any any thoughts if you were to give advice around either diversifying or Starting, what would you say? So I think you need to look across your business. So look to where there's some pain points and where actually engaging in social impact can help solve some of those pain points. So, you know, again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, but in the, in the share market, there's a cost for a business of maintaining the share registry across its shareholders. So there's off-the-shelf products um, and services that ShareGift offer that you can just incorporate and offer out to your investor market that might, um, in the first instance, just encourage those holders of unmarketable parcels to actually donate those. And then there's an immediate cost benefit. So actually taking some of those novel ideas to different teams within the organisation. I mean, ShareGift's quite unusual in that we're primarily dealing dealing with the board and the company secretary team. So it's a different type of engagement and it's a different leadership inside the organisation, but that's one way of diversifying and thinking about giving not just as an employee-centric model. Yeah, fantastic. Meg or Anthea, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, sure. I'm just to sort of echo some of what um, Victor said, I think obviously the values alignment is really important, both in terms of, um, you know, if you were starting a new program, choosing which causes to support, especially if you're, there are some organisations that, you know, champion one cause or a couple of causes. And if you're going to do that, you want to make sure that that cause resonates with your employees. Um, and and I, I mean, the values alignment, both in terms of causes, um, but also in terms of activities. Um, so like from a fundraising perspective, we see all sorts of things from um, really easy to do, like 30 minutes of movement a day to um, we've had several corporates do things like adventure challenges with us where they go and um, trek Lara Pinta. But if you don't have if you don't have a group of people working for you that, are, you know, ready to go on a trek, it's obviously not going to be a success. So it is really obvious. But the more that you know about your team and your staff and what they're interested in and what what their pain points are, what they might like to do together, the more successful the program will be. Um, and I might just, um, just I know that this is the corporate stream, but um, I know that there are charities that are attending um, this as well. 
um, just the key thing that I hear time and time again from corporates is they, they want more impact stories from charities. Um, so the more that, the more, if you are starting to work with more corporates, which is maybe why you'd be at a session like this, um, the more that you can share about your impact, the better, um, the better it will be. Fantastic. Thank you. Meg, did you want to add or you, you're good? Oh, no, I'm, I'm happy to just build on it. I think what Victor and Anthea and um, Anna have said are, are all very true. And I think it's about just asking your stakeholders um, and also speaking to other companies that may have existing programs to really understand what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, and, um, and, and going back to why you would look to do something like this and, and again, that alignment to your, your purpose and the culture that you want to um, have in the organisation. But I certainly think do your research first um, and make sure you um, you have alignment in um, your objectives as well as um, understanding the level of readiness within the organisation, whether it's a, a small or large organisation, a, a listed company or a non-listed company. Um, yeah. Do the research. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. And finally, as we wrap up, and I think it's a fitting sort of point to talk to, is what do you think the role um, inspiration plays in getting people sort of uh, involved in giving in some kind, whatever it is? Like, how important do you consider that as an element of program communication? And this is for anyone to answer. I think it's really powerful the the storytelling is a critical component to the success of any corporate giving program um, whether it's through the employees um, stories and their participation or whether it's through the charities and the recipients and, and what impact um, that you know giving can and can have on an organization and the organization and, and the communities that they support I think it's fundamental to any um, successful corporate giving program. Fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else want to build on that one? Yeah, I can. Um, so kind of building on what Max said, I think um, for, for volunteering at least, there's going to be some early adopters that with, well, with our platform, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, they're going to find a way to volunteer. But if you want to kind of maximize the participation, we know that one of the frequent blockers for this early majority of people to participate is no one told them about it or no one tapped them on the shoulder and told them that they're needed, their skills are applicable, even though they might be in a bank of financial services, there is a role that you can play to help a not-for-profit organization. So that that's a frequent blocker that we, we face. Well, why didn't you participate? Your whole team went, well, I didn't know. So that messaging comes back really well. And also the the kind of translation piece between what a not-for-profit actually is asking for what they need and how to make it kind of make sense to the volunteers, the corporate volunteers and givers to go, well, yes, I can actually do this and commit to this. That's the other piece that's actually quite vital as well. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Oh, Anna, you go, please. And the other piece, just to echo Meg's comment about looking to what your corporate peers are doing, I think you can draw real inspiration from other corporates as to what they're doing and might, they might be in a different industry but how you can transplant that into your own industry I mean this is a real thought leadership and corporate leadership piece that can be a real competitive advantage so actually thinking with some curiosity and talking to peers can be incredibly valuable and cut through as to what works and what doesn't I think that's a very powerful point thank you very yeah, much I I'd probably say this is probably one of the um, areas where collaboration does happen between companies. Um, you know, I've got a great network within, um, you know, counter sort of people in other companies that have my role and we openly share because we know there's a bigger purpose and a bigger impact at play here um, that we can learn from each other. So it's one, one of the areas, whilst it can be a competitive advantage, it, it has the mutual benefit for everyone to share their learnings and insights. It's I think that's inclusive, which is awesome. What's that, Anna? Say that a bit again. It's not mutually exclusive. It's a public good in that everyone yeah. can participate and add to the aggregate overall benefit. Totally. 
that's a fantastic summary. Thank you. Um, so we're now at four minutes to two. I'd like to thank you so much for participating today. I'm sure um, there's a, a lot of people out there that will have gained some valuable insights from um, what you've been able to share with everyone today and how various programs work. So thank you so much for your time and for